there are those who insist the authenticity of the shroud has not been proven. What's more, they contend the idea that it once wrapped the crucified body of the historic Jesus can indeed never be proven. Recently, others have challenged that assumption, and the search for historic and scientific evidence that might corroborate the authenticity of the shroud goes on. And even Cardinal Severino Paletto, the papal custodian of the Holy Shroud at the cathedral in Turin, finds the search fascinating. My attitude towards science is one of great respect, and scientists, many scientists in the world study the Shroud and carry out research, and they see what can be discovered step by step as studies proceed. And if science in the future offers us well-founded and incontrovertible elements, we will always be delighted. Pope John Paul II said that it was not the task of the Church, but of the historians and scientists to define whether it is authentic or not. For a significant number of researchers, at least some answers could very well be found in a cathedral in Oviedo, Spain. In chapter 20 of the fourth gospel, uh, we read how the two disciples, the beloved disciple and Peter, ran to the tomb on Easter morning, having heard that the tomb was empty. Now, there's been all kinds of speculation as to the position of the cloths, how they saw them, but really, that's unnecessary. The original Greek text is really quite clear on that. And the other disciple ran more quickly than Peter and came first to the tomb and, stooping, sees lying the sheets. Comes therefore also Simon Peter following him, and entered the tomb, and he beholds the sheets lying, and the kerchief which was on the head of him, not with the sheets lying, but apart, having been wrapped up in one place. What the researchers and scientists are hoping to establish is some of what modern jurists call corroborative evidence. Does the kerchief in Spain somehow match up with the shroud in Italy? Interestingly enough, the scientific studies that have been done on the Sudarium do, in fact, support the findings of the Shroud researchers. For example, modern investigative techniques permit the blood stains on the Sudarium to be superimposed over those on the Shroud. The result is astonishing. The stains coincide in the three main things. First of all, the blood group, AB. Second, stains corresponding to the back of the head are blood that was shed in life. There are many little stains. They were caused by some kind of sharp object that had penetrated the skin. By overlaying uh, images of the two cloths, the blood stains, the actual shape of the stains does coincide, which leads to another medical conclusion. These two cloths uh, were used on the same corpse. It's a purely scientific conclusion. Now, if it covered the same corpse as the Shroud of Turin, well, obviously the Shroud is at least as old as the Sudarium. But setting aside the obvious similarities, there is one very important difference. Unlike the history of the Shroud, the history of the Sudarium is undisputed. And by firmly and scientifically establishing a direct correlation between the two artifacts, their value to the new quantum physics is inestimable. The modern controversy, however, didn't really begin until 1898, when a gifted Italian photographer, Segundo Pia, was given unprecedented permission by the King of Italy to photograph the shroud. What he caught on his two glass photographic plates stunned the world. The image on the cloth itself, the faint, almost ghost-like markings on the fabric, actually appeared in reverse a positive image came up on what should have been a photographic negative. For the first time in history, the likeness could be seen in full majestic detail, and the correlation between the image and the biblical description of the crucifixion was breathtaking and unmistakable. Skeptics and critics immediately began to cry foul. The very fact that the image so closely resembled the biblical description was, they said, proof that it was a forgery. Yet the image is so striking, so vivid, that a modern forensic analysis is possible. Dr. Robert Buckland, a former coroner and forensic pathologist for Los Angeles County, is well acquainted with the signs of violent death. 
This is a body of a five foot, 11 inch Caucasian male, weighing about 170 pounds. On the head, there are blood flows from numerous puncture wounds on the front, back, and top of the head. There's a swelling over one cheek, consistent with a beating. The right wrist is covered by the left hand, but there's a puncture wound in the left wrist consistent with a crucifixion injury. The classical, artistic, and legendary portrayal of nails through the palms is incorrect because the structures in the hand are too fragile to hold up the weight of a man of this size without tearing free. There are streams of blood running down both forearms originating in the wrist areas and controlled by gravity so that blood flows toward the elbows with the arms elevated and outstretched. On the back, there are more than 100 lesions which appear to be scourge or whip marks. Historians have indicated that the Romans used a whip called a flagrum. This implement had two or three thongs and at their ends were pieces of metal or bone which looked like small dumbbells. Here you can see how those end pieces from a Roman flagrum fit precisely into the scourge lesions on the body. Here on the front of the body, is a large blood stain resulting from puncture of the chest by an instrument like a lance or a spear. This weapon penetrated the thoracic cavity through the pleural spaces and into the heart. Later, after the corpse was removed from the cross and turned, blood dribbled out of the chest wound and puddled along the small of the back. There's an abrasion of one knee consistent with a fall. Finally, a spike has been driven through both feet and blood leaked from those areas and has stained the cloth. The evidence of a scourged man who was crucified and who died of postural asphyxia and cardiopulmonary failure is clear cut. The corroborating evidence, forensic, historical, scientific, and circumstantial, as the lawyers might say, is clearly in support of authenticity. The circumstantial evidence in support of the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin is simply overwhelming. In my professional opinion, it would meet the most stringent evidentiary requirements in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt. All of the evidence, with the exception of the largely discredited carbon-14 test, give the Shroud of Turin a far greater claim to authenticity than virtually any other ancient artifact, or for that matter, any other object on Earth. But now scientists say all of this connects to the latest quantum physics. What is there about the shroud that binds these new scientific discoveries to the old beliefs? What of the single image bearing fiber we spoke of earlier? Does the image itself carry information? Have the secrets just now coming to light in the scientific world been hidden in this stunning artifact for hundreds of years? Could it be we have yet to learn that the universe does not necessarily work the way we have always been taught that it did. So far, we have been able to establish a scientific level of authenticity for the Shroud of Turin. And we have seen how science is discovering a whole new realm of physics. The question is, how do these two realities come together? Could it be the answer lies not with the fabric, but with the image itself. It is not simply the fact that there is an image on this piece of cloth that has so captivated the interest of scientists, historians, and theologians. It is the nature of the image that is so profound. The shroud image is made from tiny fibers that are one-tenth the size of human hair. And the picture elements are actually randomly distributed like the dots in your newspaper photograph or magazine photograph. To do this, you would need an incredibly accurate atomic laser. This technology does not exist. According to the official published findings of the STIRP scientific team regarding the shroud image, the actual image was created by a phenomenon as yet unknown or a momentous event that caused a rapid cellulose degradation, aging, of the linen fibers. That is, an accelerated dehydration and oxidation of the very top linen fibrils of the cellulose fibers of the shroud. 
thereby creating a sepia or straw yellow colored image similar to that of a scorch. In other words, the image was caused by something, nobody knows what, that affected only the very top of the fibrils that make up the fibers that in turn make up the fabric. After thousands of hours of intense study, the world was left with yet another scientific enigma, a piece of fabric that is demonstrably hand-woven containing a surface anomaly in the shape and form of a crucified man created by some process of undetermined origin. There are other striking anomalies as well. For example, it has long been known that in addition to the explicit detail of the body image, there are also other images that were somehow transmitted onto the fabric, specifically the image of flowers. I first noticed the image of flowers on the shroud in 1985. And uh, when I found...